Hi guys, welcome back to F1 News. After a disaster class for Mercedes in Brazil, Lewis Hamilton is wondering when his team is next going to deliver him a car that's actually capable of winning a world championship. Rumour has it though the Mercedes' latest engine development is far exceeding expectations and they are several months ahead than their rivals for the next set of regulations. Could we have 2014 all over again in a very short period of time? Very much on Twitter, your thoughts on the comment section below. Hit the like button if you enjoy. Subscribe if you're new as always, I would greatly appreciate it. This is kind of crazy as well. GTA 6 was confirmed today that it's happening. And last time GTA was released back in 2013, this is the type of stuff that was going on. Now, firstly, on Ferrari, they have, well, figured out what exactly caused Leclerc's car to go so drastically wrong. They've looked into it now. They're looking also into Sainz's clutch problems that he was very frustrated with. But during that formation lap, there was a sensor in the car that picked up readings, well, it thought that it picked up readings, that would have been terminal to the car, to such an extent that the car just shut itself down. The sensor was getting readings that were telling it that if you don't shut the engine down right now, this engine is about to explode like scientists did back in Austria 2022. The engine, therefore, shut down and decided, all right, I prefer not to explode, and therefore it didn't by calling it a day. Now, this was obviously pretty disastrous because by shutting the engine down, that locked the rear axle. Leclerc then spun out of the race before it even begun. And yeah, that was the cause of the problem. Now, I do wonder whether Leclerc had got it back to the pit lane, whether they would have been able to go again because, you know, I guess he thought that his race was done, but the red flag did open the door to potentially get that resolved. But yeah, they've looked into it and this sensor went crazy on the grid formation lap. The torque divider would have started the blocking basically to the engine, putting the recovery systems managed by the hydraulics and the engine into place. So what it all means is that the engine isn't broken and they can use it again, which I guess is good. Not like it massively matters for Ferrari at this point, but um, I guess they are still fighting for P2 in the, in the Constructors' Championship. But yes, a malfunctioning sensor shut down the engine and consequently everything else shut down as well and Leclerc was there for a bit of a passive so um, I guess it's kind of good and bad. The engine is fine and can be reused, but how does this happen, right? I mean, one sensor goes wrong and all of a sudden your engine's shutting down. Like, why couldn't that happen mid Grand Prix? I mean, it could have been. Imagine that mid Grand Prix when Leclerc is on for an epic victory and all of a sudden a sensor goes wrong and the car is out of the Grand Prix, nothing of his own doing. So maybe, again, this could prove to be a blessing in disguise because maybe Fry will find a way, right? Let's find a way that a sense of failing in that way doesn't just end the Grand Prix immediately, which uh, could be the case going forward if this issue was not found. So I guess they're going to try and figure out what's going on there. Speaking of one of the, well, Ferrari powered teams in Haas, you guys might know they have put in a right of review for the US Grand Prix because loads of drivers, including Perez and I think certainly, was it Albon they were looking at as well? And even I think Norris admitted to it, went outside of track limits repeatedly at turn six during the US Grand Prix. There was no camera in place properly there, so the stewards didn't see, but there are plenty of pieces of footage, the onboards, etc., showing drivers outside of the limits. Hassam said, hey, you should exclude these drivers, Th those laps should be excluded, and they should get penalties as a result. Just like what happened back in Austria this year, where after the Grand Prix, all these penalties were applied and it was an absolute mess. But this is quite significantly after the US Grand Prix is finished, but they just met the limit of when they can submit their right for review, and it's now going through. Now, the meeting was adjourned today until tomorrow, at which point they will reconvene to announce whether there is new evidence promoted or presented by Haas. This is the thing when you do a right for review, you've got to present new evidence that wasn't previously available. And Haas can probably do that because let's be honest here, if the stewards had the information that Haas are gonna provide, i.e. all these drivers went over track limits this amount of times and here's the video evidence of doing it, then the stewards surely can't have had that already because otherwise they would have taken action on such footage. So I guess we'll see whether they're going to take the evening to find out how they can throw this out because it's of course easier for everyone if they do successfully throw this out. But um, it would be surprising to me if they do because Haas do have a point. Now I know that teams won't be happy about it, but they do kind of have a point. Now it's obviously difficult for the drivers because if you went outside track limits three or four times at turn six, nobody said anything, you didn't get a black and white flag, the stewards didn't seem to care, 
and you did it another 20 times, then, you know, it kind of feels bad on the driver that he's going to get 100 seconds worth of penalties because of the stewards making the mistake in the first place. But then again, the rules are the rules. You go outside track limits, you get the penalty. So we'll see. That, I think, would drop Perez down to 10th if he got all those penalties that he is supposedly getting. And Haas are very keen to try and get drivers ahead of them demoted. Now, in terms of championship position... This kind of matters for Haas because with the recent resurgence of Alfa Tauri, they're sitting pretty at the bottom of the standings, I'm pretty sure at the moment. And, um, you know, they want to get some more points, which they would accrue if this was to go through. It's not kind of a big deal for Haas in terms of uh, battling the constructors. The other teams won't be bothered about it and it won't really, in the grand scheme of the season, seem to matter that much. But it's nonetheless an interesting point to see what the stewards' decision is on this because a controversial one, no doubt. Now, Brazil was so painful for Mercedes that they're still trying to figure out and wrap their head around exactly what went wrong, what they've got to change going forward. And Hamilton, after the race, said, all right, maybe this was out of emotion, which I think is also understandable, but he wasn't predicting Mercedes are going to get particularly close to Red Bull for the next couple of years. And to be honest, from an outsider's perspective, does it look like Mercedes are going to get close to Red Bull for the next two seasons? Not necessarily. Red Bull gave up on this RB19 a long time ago. It is still far clear of the W14. They've been working on the RB20 for a long time, as have Mercedes, but they've brought more upgrades in the last few races that have worked, and then they go to Brazil, and all of a sudden, it doesn't look so good, and Hamilton says, yeah, probably Red Bull are going to stay ahead for the next two seasons. Now, if Hamilton didn't really believe they can challenge again, would he have signed a two-year extension? Probably not. So you must have some confidence that they can. I'm sure that emotion was, um, you know, a factor in the words that Hamilton said after the Grand Prix, but nonetheless, he makes a fair point, because does anyone really expect anyone to challenge Red Bull for the next couple of years, it's going to be a massive challenge to achieve that. But what people are looking at, right, is especially from Hamilton's perspective, what happens after that? Hamilton really wants the eighth title. And is anyone going to be able to beat Max to 24-25? Seems unlikely. 26 is, though, a good chance. Hamilton will still be at a reasonable enough age, you would think. I mean, he'd be younger then than Alonso is now, pretty much. So would he still be able to win a championship? You would think so in a car that, well, is actually capable of winning one that Mercedes have not had for the last couple of years. So Formula Uno come up with a very interesting article here. Few bombshells in this really on the, well, the power unit development for 2026 and the testing of using them on test benches to see how they are getting on. On, I suppose, the, um, well, the internal combustion engine side of it, there's 50-50 going into 2026, 50% ICE, 50% electrical components. There's no longer an MGUH and he goes into detail here in the article exactly what's going on there. We know that it wasn't long ago now that Christian Horner and Red Bull have been very much against the regulations. They want them to be changed. They want it to be less on the electrical components, more on the ICE. And I agree, but you've got to think that one of the reasons why they might be doing that is because do Red Bull think that on their own Red Bull powertrains, they're going to be as competitive on those elements as they presently are with Honda in charge, or are they going to be falling back somewhat? Because if you had to predict who's going to make the strongest engine going into 2026, your money might be on Mercedes, given what they did when the turbo hybrid era first came around. And this is what Formula Uno say, that um, these guys are getting ready already to put these new engines on the test benches, see how they're performing. And Mercedes are several, well, he says a few months ahead on this very aspect. So they're ready to put their first test ideas on the test benches right now. Whereas according to Formula Uno, the other competitors, that is Ferrari, Renault, Honda, Audi, and of course, Ford as well, who have the partnership with Red Bull, maybe more on the electronic side, but whatever, those are the competitors. Rumor has it that Mercedes are several months ahead. Now, now, what does that several months ahead translate to in a couple of years' time when the engines are being made? Is that, you know, 10 horsepower, 20 horsepower? I don't know. But it might be somewhat significant. And this has been a rumor for some time that Mercedes are leading the charge. And this kind of confirms that is the case according to rumors. Now, it'd be interesting to know who's behind because, you know, how close are Red Bull? How close are, you know, Ferrari, for example? I'm not frankly expecting that much from Renault. But I will say, and of course, Honda, I mean, they should do a great job. And they're partnering solely with Aston Martin, which is just really exciting going forwards. Now, Audi... 
there's been lots of rumors about Audi lately as to what their future is going to be, whether they're even going to still commit to this project, which sounds outrageous for them to consider that after getting into Formula One and messing everyone around, they're now going to say no and leave before they've even begun. I doubt it. But um, apparently they are struggling somewhat and Audi are somewhat behind the other teams right now. Apparently Mattia Bonotto is a man they want to come over and potentially bring some solutions to their situation, which would be very exciting if we maybe got Bonotto and even, let's say, Carlos Sainz, because he's been linked to the Audi project as well in the near future. That could be plausible. So stay tuned for that, whether potentially Bonotto to Audi is actually going to happen. But rumours indeed say that Mercedes are ahead of the pack on their current 2026 engine development. The issue, I guess, with Mercedes is, let's say they do have the strongest engine. It's unlikely they will have a stronger engine to such an extent that they had back in 2014 when the car was and the engine was way faster than what anybody else had put together. But even if it's marginally so, that should be enough of an advantage to give them a championship contending car at the very least. The question I have, what about the aero side? Because the likelihood is that going into 2026, there is still some degree of ground effect. It might not be, the car's going to be different then aerodynamically and from an engine perspective, which makes this the biggest set of regulation changes in a very long time come 2026. But also if there's still ground effect and if there's, you know, movable aero components, stuff like this, you know, ground effect, Mercedes have struggled with, you know, the last couple of seasons. They haven't got to grips with ground effects the way that Adrian Newey and his team at Red Bull have. Given another couple of years of understanding, you'd think they'll be there or thereabouts. But it's still, you know, I'm sure Mercedes would prefer to go back to a time where there was no ground effect and they were working with the cars that they were creating in 2019, 2020, years such as that, where they were so dominant compared to the rest of the grid, at least in the W11, despite the fact that at that time, the engine performance advantage wasn't anywhere near as big as it might have been, let's say back in 2014 through to 2016. It's also interesting to note that the engine performance kind of dictates what you do aerodynamically because if you have a very powerful engine and the belief is that you have a more powerful one compared to your rivals, you can afford to design the car to be less slippery, you know, to be a little bit draggier maybe, generate a bit more downforce, but still you know, maintain the top speed that other teams have because your engine's stronger. So, you know, once you know how good your engine is, then you can start making decisions on how you design the aero. And it'll be interesting to hear over the coming months what the other rumors are on how far are other teams behind Mercedes right now. Of course, things could change. But as I said, if you had to bet on a team to make the strongest engine with these new set 50-50 ICE electrical, Mercedes is probably the team that you might well put your money on. But at the end of the day, aero understanding standing is probably going to spell the difference again in 2026. I doubt that a stronger engine is going to be enough if you don't have the aero side of the performance dialed in as well. And this is what McLaren is saying, that they understand that their car over a single lap is pretty much as good as the Red Bull. The issue they have is on tyre degradation. As the stint gets longer, the Red Bull is easier on its tyres, Probably it's anti-squat, anti-dive suspension design is at a more extreme level than McLaren's is. They do have a similar-ish suspension structure, McLaren, and I'm sure that other teams have realized this, and I'm sure that other teams will try and replicate it going into next season. But it doesn't matter if your engine is absolutely dominant, if you're destroying your tires like Ferrari have done historically over the last couple of years, and Mercedes did in Brazil, then it frankly just does not matter. Does it mean that we're going to get better racing back in 2026? Possibly. Well, hopefully at least, yes, it, this weekend in Brazil was the lowest number of overtakes we've had since 2011. Now, overtakes doesn't, you know, equate to how good the race was, but there is some correlation, right? I mean, give me a race with 150 overtakes versus a race with five. I can tell you which ones are likely to be more entertaining. Now, it's not just about overtakes, but there's a weak positive correlation, I would say, between the two. The thing that you tend to find in Formula One and really driving in general is that it's the racing that is exciting. It's the wheel-to-wheel -wheel action, the Alonso versus Perez battles. In regular sports, when you see Djokovic or when you see even as frustrating as it is for me to say Manchester City dominate the Premier League or the Champions League or whatever, let's say they smash in somebody 6-0. At least you can appreciate while watching it, as frustrating as it might be to non-Man City fans, you can appreciate, you know, the dominance in the air of Erling Haaland, the passing play, you know, the strategic football, this type of stuff. You can see it, you can appreciate it. But when a man is driving a car that's half a second quicker than the other man in the other car, 
you can't really see it with your eyes that the dominance that he is displaying. And it was the same in, you know, the Schumacher days, the Vettel days, the Hamilton days, and now in the Verstappen days as well. It's just a quirk of the way motorsport is that somebody driving around at the front of the field isn't impressive to the eyes as it might be a dominant team in sports or even just, you know, a singular person sport. So you need the good racing to create the entertainment or you can get it. You can see the driver's skill over a single lap, you know, like one shot qualifying or just qualifying in general, let's say, you know, Saudi Arabia 2021. That's the type of stuff where you can really see the drivers at their limit, pushing it to the edge. Like that's the stuff where you get the feeling of it. You don't really get the feeling of it in a Grand Prix unless you've got drivers wheel to wheel, which is why, you know, hopefully over the next couple of years, Red Bull will actually have some more competitors. For now, by the way, Formula One's revenue is going up. Actually, year on year, F1 revenue is up by 24%. Now, this is somewhat misleading leading when you consider that definitely the interest in the sports, the viewership of these type of numbers, social media engagement is down massively year on year. And as you'd expect with Verstappen winning everything, you know, you kind of know what's happening before the weekend begins. That doesn't mean though that revenues will go down yet. There's certainly a lag time here in place. I mean, you've got to understand ticket prices going up big time inflation happening, sponsors coming in and signing a couple of year deals, getting new tracks on board as well. This type of stuff pumps their revenues up. And also you've got to say sprint weekends may be as frustrated as many of the drivers and myself are with them. You know, I guess commercially it makes sense. And that's why we'll probably have more of them. So um, I wouldn't expect these type of numbers to maintain for too much longer, but it's definitely one to have a look at. And just before we close out here, I thought this is crazy. Fernando Alonso has taken the record for the most podiums at one track without winning there. It's remarkable that he had his first podium at Brazil at Interlagos in 2003. He then had a podium almost every year for the next decade. He only missed 2004, 2009, 2011, was on the podium every other year. And since then, it's been a decade. And he's now finally secured that record with that incredible P3 in 2023. Maybe next year, if the Aston Martin is a rocket ship, then he'll be in position to actually finally break this streak. But very much interested in your thoughts in the comments below. Hit the like button if you enjoyed, subscribe if you're new, take care, and I'll see you next time.